You have served on the board or served on boards of several companies, uh, Norton LifeLock, which used to be Symantec, yep. right? Uh, Gainsight, Box, exactly. So the bottom line is you have seen some stuff. <laughs> you have yep. seen some stuff. So, but we had a chance to talk and meet, and so I cherry-picked seven uh, moments from your career that I think there's incredible professional lessons there. And so we're going to, you know, click into each one of those, and you're going to uh, describe here. And we're going we're gonna to start with Mercury Interactive. Yeah, good. And hit the scenario. I'm going to call this scenario uh, Play Bigger, uh, because there's a book called Play Bigger that your, your colleague uh, Christopher Lockhead uh, co-authored, which is a great book. And um, he, in there they describe this scenario of going from a company that uh, was, you know, kind of a small software company, I think Christopher says, you know, you had a bag of doorknobs, like a lot of different tools, and how you turned that into basically a whole new category and became a billion dollar software company that yeah. HPE eventually purchased for over four billion, I think. So, so what was your role at Mercury Interactive during that, and, and what did you learn watching that? Because you know, there's a lot of companies in this room, I'm sure either you know, they have new as a service stuff that they want to explode, or they're born, born in the cloud company and they want to do that same thing. Yeah. So, yeah. so tell great. us about that. Well, thank you, and thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. Um, so yeah, Mercury was a, a great example of a software company in a 15 year span, got almost to a billion dollars, ultimately was bought by HP for four and a half billion, um, but really ran two category, two very distinct category plays during its 15 year life. I wasn't there for the first, I was there for the second, mm -hmm. I was running go to market. And what they did initially was they created at a time when, so they were, this was kind of early 90s, um, software was becoming really big. Um, software was also really bad, right? Mm -hmm. The quality of software no. was quite poor and there wasn't, there was a very ad hoc application delivery process at the time. And so what, what Mercury did is really codify and create this category of quality assurance and the QA engineer, um, and really created a community and a role around a formal QA engineer process that didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. In kind of today's world, you could look at it as a parallel to what Gainsight did with customer success, okay, yep, really yep. created the category. Yep. And then what, what Mercury did is took their first you know, anchor product in testing, uh, which was load testing, making sure that the applications could stand up under load, then added functional testing, making sure that the applications actually did what they were supposed to do, then added test management, then added requirements management. It was a very classic play of you know, starting with a core product, adding some very, very close adjacent products mm -hmm. to extend your TAM, but very right. close, yep. selling to the same buyer. And they did it, you know, arguably, I would say that's the easiest category right. play to do, yep. and they did it very well. And that, that really fueled the company to about $350 million. Mm -hmm. So really great um, rise. And many companies would have been very satisfied yep. with that. Yeah. But Mercury saw, and actually at the same time, that category was being fueled by, I don't know if you, how many people in the audience remember Y2K, but you know, we were- Now we are really know, dating y, ourselves Y2K here. Y2K was going to destroy the world yeah. and software had to be um, tested yep. to make sure that it would survive through Y2K and that really, really fueled that category. But you know, Mercury was aggressive and said, you know, this is a great category, but it's not an overly strategic category. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're kind of down in the bowels of app delivery. You're not really up at the CIO level. We are by far the dominant player in this category. Y2K is great, but it's going to come and go, and um, we're going to need more TAM. And when we go get more TAM, we'd also like to have more strategic TAM. Yep. So what we did is we created a category called business technology optimization. And what we did is we went right uh, in the IT stack over to operations. Operations had a lot more TAM mm -hmm. than app delivery. So we jumped into the application performance management market and connected it back to delivery. 
kind of the early days of DevOps, uh, but it was connecting back to testing, not to dev. And then we went up to the CIO and we actually created, through an acquisition, IT portfolio management, and we tied business outcomes, a company's business processes, to the applications and the infrastructure that was powering those business processes. And that was business technology optimization. We brought in Christopher Lockhead no. play, of now Play Bigger um, fame, who is just a legendary Marketing. category creator. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we transformed ourselves into a BTO company. And you could say we faked it till we made it or acted it till mm -hmm. we are it. Um, mm -hmm. We did all of that. We had a ton of mojo. R really, when we were still pretty much a testing company, we transformed ourselves, I would say, from the inside out into being a BTO company. Um, we did value selling. Uh, we did enterprise solutions consulting. We did you know, A-plus enablement. We did all the things that you needed to do to move yourselves from being a transactional, yeah. really product company to a strategic to the CIO, really solutions company. Yeah. And, and did it very well and ultimately got bought by HP. You know, and I think what, for the people in the room, it's so, so important about that journey, and Chris writes about it in the book, but is you have to have a strong point of view. And, and, and for a lot of you, and again, even if it's a new as-a-service offer, there's still doorknobs in the bag. It's like, oh, I, can, I have this technology, or I've got this yeah. piece here. And there is no vision. There yeah. is no point of view about how you are going to change your customer's world. What are you bringing to the table and what is your vision of the future of whatever this is? And so category creation is about painting a new vision. And I think in getting everybody in the company, there, there can, I forget the term he uses, Zeds or Zells, but there can be nobody who's running around who's like, yeah, I don't think that really we should do that. And I'm sure it, at that time, it, there's probably some people who are like, can't we just stay with the testing? Yeah. I, I actually think it's, it's a really great point. I think it's almost easier to create a category from nothing mm -hmm. than it is to extend, create a category from an anchor point that you already have. Because, you know, one of the things Christopher did, and any of you who know Christopher, he's, he's quite blunt, um, but you needed it, right? Mm -hmm. He, um, you know, he started calling testing, which was the lifeblood of mm -hmm. the company and quite successful mm -hmm. by any measure. He started calling testing knit norky and mm -hmm. you know not strategic, and it was like, wow, can can he do that? You know, that just seemed almost. But he had, but had to do it to break again to create to a new mentality. It. Yeah, had to break the mentality. Yeah. Had to get the company to understand. You know, basically put the company in a zone of discomfort, which made the company feel like if you just keep doing this thing that you're doing that you think is great you're gonna ultimately hit the wall. And yeah. he did that very effectively because, you know, if you, if you think about leadership ultimately as making people face reality um, and then motivating them to change, yeah, right. right? Sometimes the making people face reality is the hardest part yeah. of that process. Yeah, we see and, that, yeah. and, and sometimes you need a knock over the head and he was yeah. our knock over the head for yeah. sure. And I think the equivalent for anybody who's a hardware company here, the equivalent of what you're describing is to walk in you know, to the executive team, to everybody and say, hardware margins don't matter, right? That's just like, yeah. you, you're at HP, it's like walk, walk in and say, yeah. hardware margins just don't matter. I mean, I'd be like, people would be like, what are you talking about? Yeah. That is our lifeblood. That's, but that's sort of what you have to do yeah. if you're going to have a bold vision um, and jumpstart growth. So, so I want to actually go to, to um, HP because yeah. you were there. And I'm going to call this scenario turning the Titanic because this was when we're talking HP not separate, not HPE, yeah, HP Inc. This yeah, is like exactly. the whole enchilada. Yeah. All right. And, but you were there at a time when it was clear they needed to be operating differently. And yeah. so what was your role and what, what did you take away from that one? Well, um, actually, first clarify what, what you said. This is, this is HP before the split. This right. is big mm -hmm. HP. And, you know, Meg did the split and has since set HPE and HPI up for kind of focused success. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and they've done some very cool things since mm -hmm. then. But this is really about that period when HP was a huge conglomerate. We, you right. know, we used to call it kind of the Walmart, the Costco of <laughs> IT. It had everything. 
Um, we had 120 billion in revenue, 330,000 people. I mean, we were as a company, you know, bigger than most, you know, right. tier two cities in the world. Right. And um, we did just about everything. And you know, the company was trying to transform to the future. It was a it was a hardware company, both in terms of the PC and the print franchise, as well as the data center franchise, mm -hmm. server storage and networking. From the EDS, is that you're referring from the EDS acquisition? EDS, yeah. 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 Um, and so, um, actually, EDS came during this time. Okay, and yeah. so, you know, what the company was trying to do was to transform to a future model. But, you know, I would also say that 10 years later, it's, you know, hindsight is wonderful, right? <laughs> 10 years later, we know how the story played out, right? We knew. We know that cloud took off. Right. Um, we know that workflows, workloads in the enterprise moved right. to the cloud in a very significant way. In those days, the cloud was there, but you didn't know how it was going to play wow. out, right? Microsoft right. hadn't really made yep, their the pivot yet, yep. which, you know, that kind of was Satya 2015. This yeah. is well before that. And so there was still a thesis that um, there would be be a lot of hardware in the world, yeah. um, and arguably there is still hardware in the world, sure. just less than we yeah. all thought at the time yeah. there might be. And so what you saw HP doing was um, what many legacy companies do. They were um, using their capital for M&A and yeah. for stock buybacks yeah. and taking a ton of cost out of the company. And yeah. none of that was bad, right? When you're when you're 330,000 people, 120 billion, you have a ton of costs to take out. Right. And so Opportunity. Right. Um, we had Carly Fiorina, to Mark Hurd, to Leo Apotecker, to Meg Whitman, and you know each of those regimes took a lot of cost out of the company, and in many cases, not all, but in many cases, made the company a, a, a stronger company mm -hmm. because of that. But what you saw is lots of activity around major M&A mm -hmm. um, that was intended to transform the company to the future model and yet didn't play out that way. And yeah. in some cases, it didn't play out that way because the market changed. In many cases, in HP's case, I don't know if you just mm -hmm. caught that Carly Fiorina, Mark Hurd, mm -hmm. Leo Apotecker, mm -hmm. Meg Whitman, but you know, four CEOs in five years. Yeah. In, in yeah. some cases, the M&A didn't play out because you had a CEO regime change yeah. that had a different point of view. Yeah. And so um, Mark Hurd bought Palm, and which was um, a hardware company, a device company that also had an operating system. Yeah. I, had, I had a Palm Pilot. I yeah, I had, I, a, I had a Palm Pilot. It was, it was incredible. Um, and we launched, uh, in the summer of 2010, 2011, we launched an HP tablet with the web operating system on the tablet. And the thesis at the time was to be a full stack provider. And there was nothing wrong with that mm -hmm. thesis, right? Yeah. Apple was a full stack provider. And it was, look, you could get more of the value chain if you had not just the hardware, yeah. but if you had the operating system and you could then build a lot of services yeah. around the operating system. So we launched the touchpad in um, the summer, I think it was the summer of 2010. Um, 49 days later, we killed the touchpad. Wow, um, I don't and, remember that. And part wow. of the reason, and I can tell you that for sure because mm -hmm. my daughter, my oldest daughter, was a summer intern. She's so excited. She was a summer intern at HP, and she was Working on, on that tablet program? <laughs> she was on the touchpad <laughs> launch team. She was oh. in the white glove launch team. Mm -hmm. She was so excited. So she was launching the touchpad. We went on vacation, and while we were on vacation, they killed the touchpad. Oh, man. And she's like, they called her and they said, you're now on the wind down team. And I said, <laughs> you know, honey, look doesn't at it sound, That way. doesn't sound yeah. as exciting. I said, That's you're the only so summer intern in history that has done the whole product life cycle, life cycle <laughs> in a single summer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah. um, Leo Apotecker, so Mark Hurd was, went out quickly because of a, a harassment scandal, and Leo Apotecker came in, and he came in as a, a former SAP, a software guy. He didn't care about hardware. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, in this, like, 
turned out to be a flame of, of glory for him, um, not, mm -hmm. um, announced that we were going to sell the PC division, right. you know, close mm -hmm. down the, the touchpad. And um, that didn't turn out very well for him because he didn't even last a right. year. Right. But my point is, Palm was, for Mark, a very strategic acquisition that right. was setting the company up for a path that then Leo yeah. didn't agree with. So, you know, who knows? Maybe we, we all would still be using Palm devices yeah. if they would have stuck with if it. that didn't happen. Yeah. So, you know, as you're watching, because I do think that the, the HP case study is illustrative for, for everybody that's in a company that's been around for a while. You do have a lot of, of legacy, and you are trying to figure out, you know, the next turn. Yeah. And, but, but you have a culture that I'm sure it, it's tough to get people to want to, you know, go to that next turn, right? So, so, and again, cutting cost is not the next turn. Yeah, that's not the next turn, right? You know, and and so, you know, is there any, you know, when you look, like you say, hindsight's awesome. When you look back, is there anything that that you think could have been done differently to try to get more focus? I know, I know, there was a lot of chaos at the CEO level, but below that. Is there, is there anything that when you look back and say, I think we should have maybe taken this differently in terms of just focus yeah. or approach culturally? You know, look, I think, um, you know, first of all, I was there for 10 years, which I never thought I would be, and I learned a ton, yeah. I would say. Um, but, but much of what you learn is the good and the bad, right? And mm -hmm. watching this really iconic company Brand. Oh, try absolutely. to figure it out. Um, yeah. and, and an amazing tech company, an amazing customer-centric company, and just a lot of really smart people there. And, um, you know, I think ultimately having a company that's trying to do consumer and enterprise is really, really hard. Yeah. And so yeah. I think if you yeah. roll forward to 2015, the split of the PC and the print business from the enterprise business was the right thing mm -hmm. to do. And, you know, in the, in the consumer business, being a device business is fine, mm -hmm. but they needed to be free to go prosecute their own yeah. agenda. And, yeah. And you know we probably should have done that a, a lot earlier, yeah. not the way Leo wanted to do it, yeah. but um, but should have done it a lot earlier. And on the enterprise side, you know, look, I you know maybe I'm biased because I came from the software side, but one of the reasons I stayed at HP was there was, was a group of people, software executives in the software business, which was about three and a half billion at the time. Um, that were, you know, was great software talent, um, and, and HP spent, believe it or not, from 2005 to 2015, $20 billion buying wow. some of the best software wow. companies in the world, wow. right? Mercury, Opsware, the list yeah. goes on. $20 billion. And so um, what was exciting about that, if you were on the software side, is, wow, we are going to build the next great software company inside a HP company. as yep. the next big chapter. But to yeah. your point, what happens, you know, there's this saying which is you're, you're, as a parent, you're only as happy as your least happy child. Mm -hmm. And in a company, mm -hmm. it's like you're only as healthy as your least healthy business. And yep. so the enterprise, you know, Mark Hurd bought EDS for $15 billion. Yep. It was a huge outsourcing business. Um, and then the outsourcing market immediately changed. Yeah. And suddenly we had this like almost albatross of a huge business that was bleeding cash. And honestly, software just gets got lost in the shuffle, yeah. right? You're, you've got hardware, you've got this huge services business, you've got these big problems that yeah. you, you still have to go to the street and report every quarter. And you know, and you would go to these executive meetings, and all people would talk about was EDS, yeah, <laughs> because right. the magnitude of the, the problem yeah. of EDS dwarfed anything we were trying to do yeah. in software. And so, you know, what I would say is the fact that the original HP OpenView franchise, plus which was quite strong, mm -hmm. plus twenty billion dollars of software M and A, the fact that that atrophied yeah. within the company and yeah. ultimately got sold off is, I think, the biggest crime. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just a fact of the issues in hardware and services were of such bigger magnitude yeah. that it became really hard to have that point of view, which is we've got to pivot this company yeah. to software. Yeah. And again, in fairness, in those days, you didn't really know 
how rapidly hardware was going to fall off the cliff or not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it, I, mean, I, I think again, I think HP is a really important case study for a lot of people in the room because there are companies here that are have been around a long time as well, like HP, that are that still have a business model the transformation they have to go through. Yeah. And you know, I think JV and I call it the Minyana strategy. A lot of times, people th think they have a lot of runway. Yeah. On this, and I would say the only difference now compared to when we watched HP go through uh, those challenges is it is that is velocity. Things change a lot faster now. The markets change faster. The business models are changing faster. So HP, in some ways, even though things are changing, they had this runway because they changed. But there was, you know, yeah. the, the rate was slower. Now it just happens like this. So I think it's a cautionary tale. Yeah. For, and then for you know, and then the good news is the split allowed. Both, you know, first time in history that the split of a company resulted still in two Fortune 50 companies, right? right so right. these were massive companies yep. in their own right, and you saw PC and print go off and buy focus, the Samsung yep. print division. You see HPE now, you know, continuing to evolve and innovate and reinvent itself as a leaner, more focused data center infrastructure yep. and now software yep. again yep. company. Yep. Uh, they're doing. HPE GreenLake mm -hmm. and putting a services model around. Yep. So they're doing a lot of really good things. Now that um, you know, outsourcing is gone, the big software business is gone, mm -hmm. they can now focus yep. on, on kind of reinventing their core. So the tale's still to be told there. We'll there's a, there's the tale's, a tale's still to be told still there. To be, I still believe yeah. blue, both blue and green. There you go. There you yeah. go. I can tell. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, um, so I want to springboard from you know, sort of that experience at HP to more specifically managing through crisis, because you in your career have been at some companies that have faced significant crisis. And so when that happens, you know, and in, in where, you know, all hands on deck, you know, board yeah. level crisis, what have you learned watching that happen? Yeah. You're working with your peers and... Well, you know. um, and I won't use an HP example, although no. we had many. We used to say to people that would come to HP and then get rattled as things would happen, we used to say, oh no, this is really great for you. You get a free M you get a free MBA in crisis management mm -hmm. every day. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and it was true, right? Yeah. You, you really learned a ton through that process. But I'm going to talk, just given what's happening right now in the market, mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about a period when um, the tech market crashed uh, over 75%, mm -hmm. uh, and there was a geopolitical crisis mm -hmm. going on. And while that sounds a lot like 2022, mm -hmm. um, it was actually 2001. Yeah, I remember. And yeah. um, that was the dot-com crash of 2001. And you know, kind of like the crash that we're experiencing right now, which has been fueled by um, cheap, low interest rates and cheap money, yeah. uh, and investors getting frothy about growth, and then pandemic-fueled spending. Yeah. And so kind of investors, you know, ran the market up, and, you know, then ultimately things come back to reality, and, and people like free cash flow again, right? right? Yeah, um, exactly. Well, that was really similar to what was happening in 2000 and 2001. NASDAQ had tripled. Right, because anything that had the word internet remotely associated with it um, was, you know, just investors couldn't get enough of it. And so I was at a company called Critical Path, and we did um, hosted messaging for internet service providers and large corporations, and we were the internet darling. Uh, the company I joined right after they went public, um, they went public on almost no revenue, um, and then you know revenue re revenue mm -hmm. rose dramatically, and the company you know was worth you know I think three billion dollars right. on the street, and you know we we were we were all rich on paper, right. which it doesn't matter if it's on paper, you still mm -hmm. think you still think you're rich, um, yeah. <laughs> and you know yeah. it was a, just a really great time, and then. Critical Path was one of the first companies um, to hit the skids. Because what happened, unlike today, where you have this investor-fueled frenzy around cheap money and, um, and pandemic spending, you actually have today a lot of really solid companies mm -hmm. whose 
market caps were fueled by this investor frenzy, and now their market caps are suffering, but they're still really good but, companies, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, and still they are viable going, company. They yeah. are going to recover. Right. And so um, in those days, these companies weren't legitimate companies. Right. I right. mean, you know, Critical Path, like, we, we had a good little business, but, like, we weren't, we shouldn't have been valued at $3 billion. Right. And so there were a lot of companies in those days that were, you know, people were getting uh, valued on eyeballs when nobody had any way to, the, the ad, the internet ad industry hadn't really been created, right? right? There was no way to monetize eyeballs. So companies had these huge valuations for eyeballs that weren't monetizable. Right, exactly. And yeah. so, um, we, um, in early 2001, we missed a quarter um, and the stock dropped dramatically. And then 10 days later, we announced uh, an internal investigation into financial practices, which is never a good thing. I would say that never had to be, a good that's thing. a crisis. Never that a sounds like thing. a good crisis. Um, and, uh, and, you know, like some of this stuff you really can't make up. This is a book that should have been written. Um, what did you learn in terms of working with your colleagues through that? You know, the, so the ones that were, that were there and had to, you know, steer the, yeah. steer the ship. You know, look, I, I, believe that, um, I believe that adversity reveals character. I think, um, I think the pressure that some of those sales guys were under caused them to do things that, you know, they shouldn't have done. Mm -hmm. But I also think adversity builds character. And yeah. so I think that, you know, ultimately I didn't stay at the company, but I stayed for six to nine months because mm -hmm. as a leader, you know, you're responsible for jumping in and, um, and picking up the pieces and moving forward. Yeah. And so, you know, ultimately the fact that the company, um, you know, had a business model that still needed to be evolved. I mean, there was heavy lifting to do there yeah. in the short term, you know, the yeah. emotional trauma, and I think we see that now even in this crisis, right? The emotional trauma of people being paper rich and having it evaporate in a very short right. period of time yep. is, um, you know, that's just a really hard thing to deal with with an employee base, right? Yeah. The customers were easier, quite frankly, yeah. because we were still running the service. You know, they were still getting email from us. Yeah. I mean, you know, that was kind of the easy part. There weren't really other places the customers could go. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were the provider, um, but it was really hard for an employee base that arguably it, arguably it was a false floor, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you know that's a very emotional thing for yeah. an employee base to go through. And I think I learned a, a ton as a leader about how to manage people and specifically specifically employees through a crisis. And you know one of the things I did, and I now use this both for crises as well as M and A situations, is you know you can't wake up every morning and try to reassess your situation. Should I go? Should I stay? Should I go? Should I stay? I mean, you'll drive yourself absolutely mm -hmm. crazy. And so what I did is I said, look, I've, I'm going to be in in three month increments of time. And, and if I decide that I'm in, I'm in. Mm -hmm. And for three months, I'm going to work like hell and I'm going to try to help recover this company. And three months from today, mm -hmm. Uh, put a little marker in my calendar, I will reassess the situation and decide whether I'm in for another three months or whether it's time to go. Mm -hmm. And that just gave me my sanity yeah. because I wasn't looking at everything that happened every day and trying to go, oh my God, I should have gone, yeah. right? It's like, eh, you know, I'm here for another three months. I'll assess it later and that um, that works really well yeah, I just I just want to make a, a comment about that tactic because you know a lot of time I will talk to members who they're in a company and they're frustrated because they feel the company's not moving fast enough they're not and and you can see what you're talking about I mean, they're kind of driving themselves crazy because yeah. that, that, they're like hey should I stay should I be I, I think this tactic of saying look I'm I'm in but I put time frame around it yeah I'm in for, you know, and, and again, don't say I'm in for three weeks. I'm in for three months. Yeah. If the company starts to demonstrate some progress, then I, I'll probably re-up. But the other thing I'll say, though, if the company's not making progress, I, I, I get concerned. I see a lot of professionals do not cut their losses. Yeah. 
they, they, they stay in that company, they stay in that situation, they're not happy, they know the company's not moving fast enough, and they go, well, you know, I guess I'll work, you know, keep going, and they don't really put, they don't force themselves to say, hey, if I don't see real progress by here, I gotta go. Yeah. And I think professionally that's the discipline yeah. you have to have. And that's exactly what I did, and on my third cycle, you know, now I tell people do it for six months, but in those days I did it for three months. On my third cycle, I'm like, you know what? I, I need to go. Yeah. And the other, you know, one of the things I learned much later at HP from Meg Whitman, because, you know, Meg came in as kind of the fourth of the four CEOs in yeah. five years, and you know, just had so much cleanup to do, and you know, some of it was quite brutal. I mean, when a when a company, you know, has to let go through the span of several years, seventy five thousand people, right? right. You, you know, there's a, a lot of tough decisions to be made, and what Meg did is she said, look, it's right person, right role, right time, right attitude. Um, mm -hmm. And it's nothing personal. It doesn't yeah. mean people are bad. It means you're no longer the right person for this role at this time, or maybe you are, but you're burned out. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, after like the third three month cycle, I, I was just fatigued. Yeah. I was just tired and I, and I was no longer the right person to run marketing going forward. Yeah. And I knew it, I think the company was starting to do it and we did a, Amical separation, and you know, and yeah. they were able to get somebody fresh, and I was able to move on. Yeah. You know, my next gig was Mercury, yeah. and so, you know, it worked out. Yeah. But um, I, it was much more painful for me at the time. It was later, after working under Meg, that I got a lot more mature about the transition of yeah. people, yeah. and you know, just and that's like, an important skill as a leader yeah. for sure. As a leader, yeah. it's huge. Hey, I, I'm going to jump around on you. I, I definitely want to get your perspective. Um, because you serve on the board of several born in the cloud companies, right? Box, Five9, Gainsight, exactly. Um, what have you learned by watching these born in the cloud companies grow? Because you have this, you know, wonderful perspective of you know the traditional models. Yeah. You know, and you lived in you know software companies, big Harvard companies, and but now you're watching these born in the cloud companies. Yeah. Yeah. So what's yeah. It, what are you learning? What's different there in, in, in terms? Um, yeah. They're amazing. Um, and it is interesting the way the pattern matching, you know, history repeats itself and, and pattern matching is very helpful. Um, first of all, you know, born in the cloud companies are now on their next play, right? They have to be, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you were born in the cloud, you're now, you're now 15 to 20 years old. <laughs> Right. You, you and I were talking about this the other day, and, and you're right, you know, I, I stopped and I paused when you said that, and I'm like, yeah, we keep acting like these are like, oh, they're these young, agile, you know, teenagers. Yeah, I mean, Box was, like, no. was founded in 2005, right. Gainsight 2009, right? right? So, I mean, so what happens, even if you were born in the cloud, and all of these companies disrupted something, mm -hmm. right? Either a legacy software company, or in the case of Box, a legacy hardware model, yep. right, with, yep. with shared directory. Um, uh, in the case of Gainsight, created a category, but but they all started with a disruptive, you know, first anchor play, and then what happens, right? What happens when you create a category or disrupt a category? You know, pretty soon, I, I think three things happen. Um, a, you as you grow, get more complicated, right? Mm -hmm. Complexity creeps in at the same time that customers' appetite for complexity is going the other way, right? So customers yeah. are demanding now yeah. that companies are simpler than ever, user experiences are simpler than ever, engagement models and, and, and you know, are low friction. Yeah. You know, the customer bar is really going up or down yeah. in yeah. terms of, uh, of complexity. Yeah. Um, then, you know, if your category, if you're successful in a category, you don't get to stay there unopposed, right? The big guys come in and decide that your category is really part of their platform, yeah. right? Yeah. Because they have to continue to expand their TAM. So you'll get hit from the top, uh, and then you also get hit from the bottom. You get hit from all the new players that say, oh yeah, you know, they started the category, but we can now be better, faster, cheaper, right? Mm -hmm. so, so at the same time you're getting hit from the top, you get hit from the bottom, and you end up with this almost like barbell execution need mm -hmm. to simplify yourself dramatically yeah. in terms of what you did at the core, um, to expand what you originally did into adjacent TAM, uh, yeah. 
and hopefully to do that if you can to the same buyer if you need to you know to a new buyer butter related yep. buyer but you have to become a platform and that puts you in an enterprise selling motion and a solution motion you know that is a transformation of the company yep. not just the product yep. Um, and then at the same time, you're a company that wasn't used to being profitable because you were born in the cloud company on the way up. Right. And now free cash flow matters, rule of 40 matters, yeah. all of yeah. the above. And when I look at, you know, Box, Five9, Gainsight, Exactly, um, you know, they are running all those plays, right? Mm -hmm. They have simplified, they're moving to the platform, they're covering both ends of the flank. Uh, enterprise as well as you know simple essential SMB um, they are digitizing uh, and taking friction out of the customer experience and they are you know driving towards profit and and increasingly more profit and so um, you know I'm and, and do you think the current economic environment is going to put even more pressure on you know, profitability, free cash flow in a way that we have it when money was cheaper. Do you think that that's going to change the conversation? Yeah, I do. I mean, and it's interest rate driven, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's also, I mean, I'll use Box as an example because Box was a grow at all cost company, right? The, the mm -hmm. rack for Box mm -hmm. would have not been good. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, we brought in, to your point on benchmarking, um, we brought in McKinsey, a team that I had worked with many times at HP. We brought, on, we brought in McKinsey to benchmark the whole company and um, as a board and to drive the company towards profitability. And Aaron Levy, who's the CEO of Box, who's outstanding, was very resistant to um, McKinsey coming in and benchmarking the company because Box was unique, right? Everybody thinks they're There's unique. No flight. And, yeah. and Aaron's a phenomenal CEO, but he was he was quite resistant to this. And you know, three weeks into the engagement, he called me and he said, "This is the best money I ever spent. Like this is it was so eye opening for him." And we we are. Because there were cost parameters that he didn't realize like, how out of, out of whack on? Or, amazing. Yeah, and we, yeah. had a, we had a really good McKinsey team. And we are now 15 points of op margin prop, more profitable than we were at that time. Mm -hmm. And we are a much better company because of it, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. so, you know, the ability to be leaner and accelerate growth, which is exactly what Box has done, yeah. it's a difficult maneuver, but... Um, but, you know, you can't cut your way to growth, for sure. Right. However, you can cut your way to being a better company. Now, you can't go too far, right? right? But, but yeah. sometimes the pressure on cost actually does make you a better company. In the case of Box, which is probably the biggest op margin transformation of anybody in my portfolio company because they're a billion dollar company, right? Yeah. So they had much more to play with than a Gainsider exactly. Yeah. Um, that transformation of rule of zero <laughs> to now rule of 37 mm -hmm. for them mm -hmm. has, they're a much better company yeah. at rule of 37 than they were yeah, at I mean, rule of zero. I, I mean, I'm very sympathetic with that in the sense that we, we've always felt that you know, che cheap money is not good for yeah. optimizing business models. Yeah. It, it, it basically supports bad behavior and habit is what it does. And so we, you know, we see a lot. I mean, companies will say, "Oh, we just we don't charge for that. We don't try to figure out that. We just throw that stuff in because we got we got to grow. We got to grow." And yeah. I think that this is a forcing function that yeah. exercise there. And, I, and again, I think the current economic environment is going to be a forcing function that companies are going to have to yeah. sharpen the pencils. It's, but it's going to be, it, 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 I think, it's going to be a positive exercise for a lot of companies. Yeah, and I've been um, I've been actually doing a lot of reference calls for the team at McKinsey that did the work at Box because you know <laughs> you now see a lot of companies. And I mean, the yeah. good news is, you know, I mean, look, somebody moved the cheese and decided that free cash flow mattered again. Yeah. Um, but the good the great news about this downturn is. There's a bunch of really good companies out there. there there's a bunch of more really viable, good, more viable than in 2000. More viable, yeah, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, and and I think they're going to be like Box, right? Where where they will become better as they become leaner, and they'll build the platform out, and they'll yeah. do everything you need to do. But I think it'll actually be be yeah. healthy. But they, I see companies now going through the process that we did a box of like yeah. figuring out how to get that next 10 points of op margin. Yeah. You know, and I think, and we had a conversation on this, I mean, I think the other reckoning for the born in the cloud companies 
is that you know there are legacy companies that are proving, like you said, they can go after, go into those markets, they can turn a bend. You can see a company, you know, like a Microsoft come out the other side here. And so, so for a while, where the born and cloud companies were like, hey, those legacy folks just don't get it. They're you know not in these markets. You know, there's there are more of them making it through the bend, right? And so that's it's going to be, I think, a more competitive landscape. And new disruptive born and cloud every day, right? So you, again, right. you get you get both hit, ends. You know, yeah. you you've got a lot of legacy companies that yep. have come out the other end. Microsoft is totally form, formidable, and yep. you know that was you know arguably they almost missed it, right? I mean, mm. it wasn't until Satya in 2015. I mean, they were yeah. quite late, right? right. Adobe that's was. It already three years into yeah. their cycle yeah. when when Satya came and really, you know, and that's in terms of turning to Titanic, I mean, he basically, you know, just <laughs> went like this overnight. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember I was running the partner business at HP at the time, and we were Microsoft's biggest partner. And a lot of the partnership, much of the partnership was based on Windows Server software going out on HP servers. Yeah. And overnight, you know, they have their fiscal year in July, and I remember one July, I think it was 2015, overnight, he changed the comp plan of everybody in the company. And suddenly, they were comped on Azure and cloud and no longer wow. on, like, Windows Server on top of HP boxes. Yeah. And it's like, holy cow. Yeah. I was, you know, now I think it was incredibly impressive. At the time, I was super mad yeah, yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. you know, yeah. it was like I ran the partner business and yeah. they were a huge partner. And it's like, how can he do that? Yeah. And you realize now how brilliant yeah. the move was. Yeah. That well, that's he, a convi I mean, that's, again, these, these technology leaders that have vision and conviction. And are going to lean into it. I mean, I'll, you know, I can't tell you how many inquiry calls we've had around, you know, hey, we're doing a new as a service thing, and we're not sure like how to comp on this, and they're, it, like, it's like, I want to do something, I just want, I don't want to rock the boat. Yeah. Right, and you, and you hear that, and you go, well, you know, it's like, you're not serious about this. Yeah. There is no conviction there, right? And so, um, I think it, it takes, again, I'd like to see more leaders in that bucket, where you, you know, you have to make some bold moves if you really want to go after, go where the growth is. Yeah. You know, and capture it, so. There's, I'm, I'm watching the clock, there's one question I definitely want to get on the table with you, and that is, um, the fact that you serve as the chairman of the National Action Council for Minorities and Engineering. Yeah. And so I'm curious, you know, how you became involved in, in most importantly, because this is something we're very committed to at TSIA, is how do we drive more diversity in this yeah. industry? Yeah, yeah. Um, so how did you get involved with these folks? So how did you get involved? So um, NACME um, has been around for about 50 years. And uh, Bill Hewlett and David Packard were were one of the cohorts of cor corporate founders of NACME. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. And the premise at the time, uh, so go back, you know, 50 years, maybe even over 50 years by now, the premise at the time was that in order for the U.S. to remain competitive in technology, we would need a bigger tech workforce. And in order to get a bigger tech workforce, we would need participation from women and underrepresented minorities at a level that we didn't have today. Um, otherwise, the US was risk, at risk of not having a tech workforce big enough mm -hmm. to be competitive on the global, you know, global plane. And um, so NACME is all about coming in at the university level, and we give about 1,300. I'm no longer part of the organization, but I was chairman at the time. Um, about 1,300 scholarships to women and underrepresented minorities to about 50 member institutions. And then we had about 35 to 40 Fortune 500 companies that were corporate members of NACME who gave these students internships, jobs, mm -hmm. you know, so it was kind of a, 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 of a, of a lifeline, yeah, if yeah. you will. Yeah. And, um, you know, look, I think, I think diversity is and I, I use diversity with a big D, right? Racial um, and ethnic and LGBTQ and mm -hmm. you know, gender, it's an issue. And um, you know, I'm a big fan of programs like NACME, uh, but those programs you know, really have to go back to you know, early and mid childhood when kids are getting exposed to technology or not getting exposed to technology. And so NACME was doing a lot of really good things at the, at the university level. But, you know, 
the important programs are really at the middle school okay. level yeah. as well, and then NACME can intercept them yeah. when they get yep. up to the later stage of the pathway. Um, and you know, I'm a big fan of metrics and transparency. Mm -hmm. you, you know, when I, I was an engineering grad in the early 80s, and I was a grad in the years when when we actually had EEO requirements. So oh, wow. as yeah. a, yeah, people say, how hard was it for you to be a woman in engineering? I'm like, it was easy. <laughs> because when I graduated, uh -huh. companies had to hire, I mean, I, I also thought I was pretty good, mm -hmm. but like basically <laughs> companies had to hire yeah. women and minorities yeah. because you had you had regulations. Yeah, yeah. And then EEO went by the wayside and we went through decades without it. And now we're back to not regulatory, but um, through this whole ESG initiative, you now have an EEO report now mm -hmm, yeah. that companies need to publish to their shareholders. And the EEO report essentially gives all the metrics not only on your headcount diversity, but also uh, gender pay equality, uh, you know, any any type of diversity pay equality. So lots of other additional yeah. interesting things. And so I think all those things are good. Very as, as I was going to ask, I mean, the, what do you feel are the pressure points that will help? Is it the reporting, the transparency, where companies, start, you know, they, they know they have to provide this, and so they're going to lean in more to trying to get you know, to get the diversity so that those numbers don't look so terrible or? Yeah, you know, absolutely. And that's why, look, I, I think, um, uh, first of all, I think there's no company that intentionally tries to be non-diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe maybe I've worked for only good companies who, mm -hmm. who you know, yeah. everybody would like to be diverse, but in the heat of the battle every day, when you got to hire people fast and, you know, it, you just don't do it. You, mm -hmm. you don't do it. And metrics do help. Metrics and targets do help. When you tell managers, that their teams have to look a certain way. When you tell managers that they're, the way they hire, the slates of candidates have to look a certain way, mm -hmm. all those things help when you, you know, companies are now starting to tie, ServiceNow just announced this, um, companies are starting to tie executive compensation to ESG metrics, mm -hmm. and those are diversity and now climate, right? Yeah. So. ServiceNow is an example, and many other companies are doing it. ServiceNow is tying 25% of their executive comp to both climate and diversity metrics. I think those things are all good. Yeah. And will move, will help to move the needle. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I, I just believe in, in my heart in terms of the tech industry, for us to be a successful industry, a growing industry, you need talent. And that by definition, you got to lean into diversity. Yeah. Because you know the talent wars are not yeah, the, the, you, going away. Yeah, you got to tap into the whole pool. Exactly. Like, if you're only tapping, you can't look into like an industry that says what we really pool. need. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to be at a disadvantage for sure. Huge. So I, yeah, I think it's a, an important topic. Well, I, th I think we have used our clock here, and I really appreciate the the, the conversation and taking the time flying in to talk to the audience. I know you have a wealth of experience. I encourage people if they bump into you in the hall to to say hello. But it was yeah. joy talking to you. So please, thanks, thanks Sue, for stopping by. Thank you. I really, I really appreciate it.